Amen. Good morning again. I know it's been said, but I'll uh, say it again. Good morning. Uh, is it uh, is it good to be um, a sports fan in Missouri now, or what? If you're not, um, I'm sorry. You should be right now. If you've never been, repent and become a fan of Missouri sports right now. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's great to. Uh, you know, fellowship with different people and stuff, but um, the uh, the Tigers, Mizzou, last night or yesterday beat uh, beat the seventh ranked team in the country. They beat Georgia, and um, yeah, they beat them down a little bit. You know, uh, it was good. And then uh, you know the Chiefs are undefeated. That's weird uh, for most Chiefs fans, right? Like how that you know, because we all look with like, yeah, yeah it's going to turn bad soon. You know, like. Uh, wondering when that's going to all change, but uh, but they, they they're looking good, you know. And um, the Cardinals, you know, they uh, they took a two game lead in the series yesterday, uh, going going back to L- uh, to L A to play, you know, keep playing the Dodgers. So that's good. Um, you know, the Red Sox did not win yesterday though, and I know you're all sad with me about that. Um, so um, uh, my lesson today is about. Um, Lamenting, so it's all in the book of Lamentations. I'm kidding. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews. Um, <laughs> it's not time to lament yet. It's game one. I'm okay. Um, hopefully they don't lose game seven, and I actually have to do that, right? So um, I don't know if you know, but uh, tomorrow is Columbus Day. So uh, let me be the first to wish you happy Columbus day eve day now um i just want to be the first to wish you happy columbus eve day right uh some interesting facts things i learned about columbus i, ne- I never knew you know uh, um i don't know if you knew this one of the most interesting things that i learned about christopher columbus is that uh you know um being uh you know kind of credited for finding the americas he really didn't you know, he was not the founder of the Americas. And I always thought that in my head, you know, maybe it's because, you know, I was, a, I was a bad student or something. I didn't pay attention to that part. We studied it too early. I don't know what that was. I missed that part, you know. Uh, but, we, but we celebrate, you know, or we have a Columbus Day. You know, it's just one of those things we do. In America, we find reasons to have extra days off, right? Uh, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, but uh, he actually... Uh, he made four voyages, and I think that's pretty interesting considering the fact. Uh, remember the names of his ships, right? What were the names of his ships? The Nina and the Penta. Yeah, the, uh, the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria. On his very first voyage, did you know this? He wrecked his flagship, the Santa Maria. He wrecked it, destroyed it, had to sail back on the Nina, Right? Didn't know that. See, you learn so much just being at church, right? Um, but he, every, uh, and every voyage, he actually kind of landed uh, in the isles off of Florida, uh, the Bahamas first, and then, and then he actually went through the islands and sailed to uh, South America on his fourth voyage. Um, but he had uh, the courage to do three more voyages after crashing a ship that he had been given on the first one, that's some perseverance, you know what I mean? That's, that's sticking to it. That's going after it right there. Um, but, uh, you know, that really has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about even today. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But what he did by sailing west, what he was actually trying to do is find a shorter trade route to the Far East by going west. No one had ever done that before or successfully. No, so he was trying to do this. It was a little bit selfish, absolutely, right? He wanted to be the first to establish trade routes there and be the person to bring stuff somewhere and get, you know, the money. But whatever. Um, so from that, um, he, he was the pioneer. He charted the course to America, so to speak. You know, uh, if it weren't for that, we, you know, somebody else would have. Figured it out later on, but but that's why we kind of accredit him with that. So that's pretty good. So from 1492 to 1503 was the last voyage uh, when he returned from his last voyage that uh, that he he established that that route 
you know, to basically South America. But, uh, and uh, that was eventually how the Bible reached the shores of the United States of America, you know, that we know today. You know, it's from, uh, from these ships being able to sail across the seas, right? So that's the only real spiritual connection we have. We don't, I, I, who knows, you know, uh, what Christopher Columbus, you know, did with the rest of his life. Uh, I imagine he sailed, um, you know, just given the facts, right? So we can only hope that maybe he found Jesus in the whole process, right? But, um, um, but uh, he was a pioneer, you know, of things. And, uh, and we follow a pioneer of things, right? We follow Jesus, right? He's the pioneer of our faith. You know, he's the... He's the one who, who, who did it all, you know. So uh, this morning, um, my, the title of my lesson is simply Fix It, you know. And it's, uh, maybe it's a guy title, maybe not, I don't know. But, uh, but may, it's, a, it's a self-help kind of a, a sermon, amen, uh, where you can help yourself to the Bible. But, uh, but we're going to talk about Fix It. And of course, that uh, probably strikes home with a lot of men, uh, you know. Uh, there's just something about when something's broken and you fix it and it works again, you know, almost as good as new, close maybe, at least functional again for a while, right? You know, but there's still that sense of accomplishment that you've done something successfully, right? There's a great, uh, great sense of accomplishment that comes with that. So, uh, so let's uh, dig in here in Hebrews chapter 12. I don't think I told you the chapter yet. Hebrews chapter 12, see what the Bible says about uh, fixing things. Amen? Self-help message this morning. Fix it. Easy to remember, just two syllables, right? In, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says this. Verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by, uh, by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's great to sing a song about heaven right before we talk about this, right? Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that breaks around the house. For me, anyway, sometimes. You know, and Cheryl will come to me, usually completely frustrated, can you fix this? You know, she's at her wit's end, you know. She really hasn't tried to fix it or anything yet. Uh, so to, to describe this, that, like the dyna- dynamics in our relationship, you know, Cheryl is the, she, Cheryl is the um, she's the uh, emotional stability, if you will, for our house, right? She's the multitasker. She's got everything, you know, in focus, you know, for our house. But uh, maybe I'm a typical man. If I am, that's fine. But I like the details of something and how it's put together. You know what I mean? And maybe it started when I was younger. My brother fixed one of my fishing reels with a piece of paper. I'm like, oh, that's cool. He made a little washer out of a corner of a piece of paper. He folded it to just the right depth so it would run smoothly again. I'm like, that's cool. I, I could only take it apart at that time, you know what I mean? He fixed it, you know? It was really good. So, uh, yeah, recently this happened uh, in my house where, um, not a fishing reel, but um, we have a, you have one of those apple peeler core things. You guys ever seen those? You know, you roll that thing. It's, it's really cool. If you don't have one, you got to go get one. Um, I was going to bring it today for a demonstration, but I decided not to. But it, recently, um, it broke. You know, the spring that, that holds the peeler thing in place tight enough to take the skin off but not rip the apple to shreds. You know, that spring broke. And I was the last one to use it. And Cheryl needed to make an apple pie. Couldn't make an apple pie. 
So I get a call at work. My phone starts blowing up, and I'm like, uh, what's going on? Who's dying, right? <laughs> Do you know what's wrong with the apple peeler? No. Uh, it was working just two days ago. I used it. Remember, I did this with it. And uh, I was like, I don't know. I, maybe, you know, I kind of wanted to call in some reinforcements or something, get a brother over there in my stead to fix the thing, you know. Life had ended for someone you know, who was supposed to have an apple pie. But uh, long story short, uh, I, I, I got home and I'm like, the spring's just busted, you know, and I got to go get some replacement springs and cut them to length and do all this stuff and fix it. And it works again. And you don't have to buy a new one. Amen? You like when you don't have to buy a new one. Jesus has some things I think He wants to fix in us. The Bible tells us here to we need to do what if he's going to be able to do that? We've got to fix our eyes on him. Because he's the what? The author and the perfecter. He didn't only write it, he did it. There's something to be said about a man who backs up his words. Or a woman, right? They tell you, this is what I'm going to do, and they go do it. You know? That's why Jesus is so powerful. Not only did He do it, He did it perfectly. He followed the Word of His Father. And He fixed it for us all. When we look at the big picture, standing back now, and we get to take in full the Bible in its entirety. He fixed it all because He was the author and the perfecter. Those are big shoes to try to fill for us, right? We say, yeah, I follow Jesus. When you think about it in that perspective, you're like, I can never follow Jesus. Yeah, you can. You can follow one step at a time. But you can't do it if you're not fixed on Jesus. You have to fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen, He showed us how to live the way of the cross. To live sacrificial lives. That's what will mean the most for somebody else. Not all the great things about how great you are, but how much you give up for other people for the sake of them knowing who Jesus really was. He showed us how to endure opposition, the Bible tells us here, right? It tells us that He showed us how to not grow weary. Can you relate? I can relate. He showed us how to not lose heart. You ever lost heart? Just that fraction of a second too early. You know, that that day too early. You know, when everything came together and afterward you're like, man, if I had just held on. You know, for one more day, it would have it would have all come together. I would have seen it. I could have so much more joy. My joy is good still, but man, it could have been so much greater. He taught us how to not lose heart. Those are the things we can learn from Jesus. Important key lessons in life. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. And with our eyes fixed on Jesus, He being the great physician, He can fix our ailments. I've got to bring it back around to nursing somehow, right? Um, I believe there are three things that Jesus wants to fix us fix, by fixing our eyes on Him. Amen? We're going to dive into three things today. First, we're going to dive into the fact that we have to affix or He wants to affix us to the Word, the Word of God. Secondly, we're going to talk about He wants to fix our faith. And in turn, He wants us to fix our own faith, right? And in three, it's to fix our thoughts. Turn over to Deuteronomy. That was, that was pretty dyslexic right there. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Affix us to the Word. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. A little trivia. Does anybody know what Deuteronomy means? The word. It's such a cool sounding word. Do you know what it means if you break it down? Deutero would mean what? Two. Renomical. Onami. Law. Second giving of the law. That's what this book is all about. It's the second giving of the law. Deuteronomics, Deutero- uh, basically. But anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 11. I just, that's cool. For, uh, I know the girls really don't connect with that, but, I, you know, whatever. 
I like stuff like that. It's just good. But we're talking about the Word of God, amen? So Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16. Very important what the Bible starts off here with, and goes. It, the theme runs the entire course of the Bible. I think it's the most important thing, really, that we focus on, and we talk about it a lot. But here we go. In Deuteronomy 11, maybe we can glean some new things that will help us in our own Bible study. Amen? Verse 16 says, Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and He will shut the heavens so that it will not rain, and the ground will not yield, will yield no produce. And you will soon perish uh, from the good land the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine on your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. You're getting the picture there, right? Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. To talk about the Bible, right? Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Get permission from your mom, kids, before you do that. Um, she's going to want it in a specific place. So that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your forefathers as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. A fix on the Word of God. Like I said, I know we talk about this a lot, how important it is to study God's Word. But has it lost flavor for you? Has the Bible lost some flavor? If it has, and it can, I, it has for me plenty of times. You've got to switch something up. You've got to change something up. You've got to do something a little different to stir up. Maybe read a different version. If you've never read the Message Bible, go read the Message Bible. It's paraphrased. It's, it's very... Uh, poetically written, or, or just, you know, sometimes that will help, you know, just doing something like that. But, uh, but the Bible in its nature has got to be understood that uh, just because, even if you read it cover to cover every year, it's going to change in your life as the years progress in your life. One of the rabbis of old was quoted as saying that the Scriptures are like a 60-faceted gem. 60-faceted gem, meaning that a gem that has 60 different sides on it. So if you turn it just a little bit, you see another perspective. If you turn it just a little bit again, another perspective clearly. Right? That's intense. That's somebody who had to memorize the Bible as a boy saying that. You know what I'm saying? The Bible can never lose its, its glory for us. It can never lose that, uh, that intrigue to it, if you will. Meaning this, that as you turn the pages of the Bible and as the years of your life turn, you're going to have a different perspective ongoingly. Right? You know, if those of you who are in high school now, right? When you're done with high school, it will change your perspective in life. And the scriptures that you've read prior to that, when you read them again, if you're a college student then or pursuing a career, no matter what you're doing at that point, you start reading the scriptures again because now your life situation has changed. Those scriptures are going to change. And you're going to reach, you're going to, they're going to be so much more full, so much more rich, right? When you're out on your own searching for work and a career, your perspective changes again. Even in that search, amen, <laughs> you have a real perspective uh, on prayer, most of all, right? Lord Jesus, please, something so that I can eat and I can get there the next day. A little gas money, right? And that prayer changes and evolves, right? When you get married, your perspective changes. All of a sudden, you know, you and your wife, your disciples, and my wife is a disciple. We got married in the church, and you have another person living that close to you. They don't. They, they sleep in your bed. You know, they're there. They see everything, and they never magnify any of the bad, right? 
They never bring light to the fact that you may have wronged to them. And if they do, they always do it in a very loving way. I know I do. I never complain. I never complain. I never, I, I never you know, get hostile. Yeah, I, I, I'm so good at this. And I, 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 this is another old lesson for another day. But, but when I got married, let me tell you, the Bible took a whole different perspective in life. Right? I felt like I got baptized all over again. Like, whoa, you got Jesus living in my home looking at me? What? You know? Um, and then you get kids, you know? Yo, perspective changes with, and, and with more as you add. You know what I'm saying? Those of you who have four or more in your house, you understand this gym principle, right? Not, no pun intended, gym. You know, like, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. But guys, yeah, what we have to realize and what God was trying to tell the people, what God was trying to communicate with the Bible is like, it's so rich. Don't ever let it depart from you. Because I want to be with you and I want to explain each piece of life to you as you go. And I want you to be successful in it. Successful in it. But I have to tell you guys a story about my life when Maybe I wasn't so successful with it, right? Back in uh, 1990, uh, November 15th, 1990, is when I got baptized. Coming up, you know, pretty soon here, 23. So um, um, at that time, you know, it was, um, I mean, it was awesome. The kingdom was so fresh and so new and so idealistic. And, and I, you know, I just wanted to run with my hair on fire and do whatever I could do for God, you know? And, um, but uh, over... You know, the course of about the next three years, um, the Bible, what we're talking about, started to lose flavor. You know, in God's kingdom, the idealism wore off. You know, and I saw people, wow, you guys are sinful. You didn't change everything. What's wrong with you? You know, and looked at myself, and I, you didn't change everything, you know. But I just kind of got dull, you know, and I decided, you know what, maybe this Christianity thing isn't for me, you know. So I pushed it all aside, and I went out into the world. You know, prior to that, I was never this party guy. I never, you know, I, I shouldn't say never. I, I drank underage, okay? Um, and uh, paid the penalty for that and quit, you know? But um, this is really the first time I was on my own, doing my own thing. Proceeded to ruin my life thoroughly. Thoroughly. I got involved in stuff I... Never. I, I swore I never would. Yeah. Swore I never would. I got involved in using drugs. I got involved in drinking and partying, going out to clubs heavily. I never wanted to be that guy. I never wanted to be perceived as that guy. You know? But yet I tanked all of this because I knew what it was to follow Jesus, but I wasn't going to be like, look like good on the outside and look so. I, I knew, like, I'm going to do it all bad if I'm going to do it. Bad choice on top of, you know, the already bad choices. But, you know, um, I have a lot of things in my life to this day that I have to continually refresh my mind and get over, you know, because of the stupid things that I did by just turning my back on Jesus and letting the Bible lose flavor, you know, in my life. It was the most foolish thing I ever done. But still God... After about four years, when I came back, I said, and I, he helped me just close that back door forever, you know, and be a different person. And he used that time because he's so gracious and such a loving father. He's like, I'll use this time for many lessons in your life. So you will continue to understand you never have to run again. You never have to go back to that. You, you never should even want that. You should have wanted it in the first place but I'll help you in your journey on. And God did great things for me and got me focused back on the Bible like I'd never been focused actually on the Bible prior to that. And, my, and God's done amazing things with my life and, you know, never would have been married to this incredible woman if I had not. Amen? But that 60 fast of the gem, we've got to keep it close. Turn, last passage on this point and we'll move on. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. 
Proverbs, the first uh, seven Proverbs are so rich, they're not uh, as disjunct as the rest of the Proverbs, maybe. If you've ever read through the Proverbs, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the first seven Proverbs, after Psalms there, all the Psalms, um, they, uh, they really set the stage for all the rest of the Proverbs. So anything you hear in the rest of the Proverbs come from the first seven chapters of Proverbs. So if you ever studied the book of Proverbs, something to keep in mind. But anyway, this is what Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 20 says. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them, and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. The words of the page. Make level paths for your feet. And take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Amen. The passage is about to tell us like that narrow-mindedness of I will let the Bible explain things to me about life. Because it's from the author, the perfecter of life. We can never lose that perspective. Amen. We have to affix ourselves to the Word. Amen. Point number two. Fix our faith. Jesus wants to fix our faith. And when he gets us affixed on the Bible, he can really fix our faith tremendously. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll pick it up here in verse 13. So I'm going to fix our faith. It is written, I believe, therefore, I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to glory to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is unseen is temporary, but what is uh, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Fix our faith. Amen? Jesus wants to fix our faith. <clears throat> there are so many passages about faith in the Bible, and a lot to learn about faith. With faith, it's impossible, right, to please God. It's impossible to do what we're even talking about today, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Cannot do that without faith. Because the whole story is about faith. You have to believe. There has to be that conscious belief to say, okay, Jesus is who he said he was, and I can't deny that. And the things that he did were for a purpose. And that purpose was to provide uh, salvation for mankind that had strayed so far away from him, there was no other hope or plan. He had to finish that plan. But this passage in in particular speaks of one aspect, I think, about, uh, about faith and about the faith that needs to be fixed, I believe, uh, in myself and I think even in our congregation. And it's actually kind of good. I'm a little glad that it's just kind of us married folk, single folk here. Amen? Because uh, there's nothing really that stops us from filling this room except us. Right? Yeah. We're the only thing that stops us from bringing someone with us here. Right. And we stop ourselves <laughs> in multiple ways. But it's so essential part of being Jesus' disciple. 
I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating, that the New Testament is written by people who were on the mission to people who would be on the mission or are, were on the mission for the specific purpose of the mission of Jesus Christ. So you've got to get that in our heads. Otherwise, what the Bible says about itself is that we will miss it completely. It is foolishness to those who are perishing, right? That's how it becomes foolishness if we're not on the mission field. You cannot, these stories are written about people and places and things that the gospel affected. If our lives are not affecting people with the gospel, then we're not connecting with what the scriptures are telling us. Does that make sense? So it makes sense for our faith then, because faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. All we see is a person there before us. Who they will become, we have no idea. We have no idea who they will become. Let me tell you another story about uh, this guy, Felipe. I may have spoken about him before. Felipe Basconis. When, um, before the example I gave you before, when I ruined my life, those three years, good years, you know, that I was doing great things for God and wanting to do great things for God, uh, some, uh, some of the other brothers and myself ran across this guy named Felipe. He was another guy in the military with us. Uh, we were in the Army stationed at Fort Devens, uh, Massachusetts at that time. How I ended up in New England. Uh, but that was a good thing. But um, he, uh, he wasn't much uh, in the beginning, and he'll tell you this. Uh, um, uh, someday, hopefully, he's here to tell you his own version of the story. But um, we studied the Bible with him. And uh, it's funny, like, Felipe sometimes would miss Bible studies uh, because he wanted to go play basketball. You know, he'd hide behind the door when you come and knock. I learned this afterward, of course, you know, but. Um, he would hide behind the door until I left, and then he would sneak out and go to the gym. He played like two times a day. He played in the, he played in the morning, he played at night. He loves basketball. He's a good basketball player. Um, he had reason to love it more than me. But, um, but uh, it was trying to nail Felipe down for a Bible study was a little difficult sometimes, you know? So uh, as we continue to study the Bible, I mean, that started to change. He, he started to grasp that, okay, I've got to be serious about this. Basketball can no longer be my God. It can no longer be the thing that is most important to me. The Bible's got to become that. The fellowship's got to become that. Within the fellowship, maybe we can do some great things, you know, on the basketball court. But beyond that, you know, I just need to change my mentality, you know. And it was only, uh, so he, you know, finished studying the Bible, got baptized, and uh, it was awesome. And um, But then he was the only one of all the brothers, there's about, uh, 18 to 20 of us uh, stationed uh, at Fort Devens. He was the only one of all of us that got sent to Desert Storm. He's the only one that had to go to war. Um, and that shaped his faith, you know, a lot more, you know, uh, being over there, you know, and, uh, and, and seeing war happen changes an individual, you know, and uh, it really woke him up. It really helped him to really focus in a lot better and a lot more on what he was doing. And, uh, and he's he, he a great man. Three weeks ago, he was appointed. I can't talk about my friends without getting emotional. But, um, it, and it's encouraging. It's exciting. He was appointed evangelist three weeks ago. And, um, man, I'm just so proud of him. But you know him because you know Melissa. Yeah. He married uh, Brandon Basco, and Brandon became his wife. And uh, Melissa was raised in their campus ministry in, in Worcester. And, uh, and now he, leads, he and his wife lead the church in Stores, Connecticut, the University of Connecticut. So that's your connection to Felipe as well. Great man. Like I said, I hope he gets to, to come here, you know, and, and, and visit us someday. But um, here's the thing about the mission that I've learned over the last uh, about 10 years, I would say. The longer you're off for the mission, being intentional about it, the harder it is to get back to it. It becomes increasingly difficult for this to be a main piece of your life. And you know what else it does? Like any other bad habit, it gets easier to go back to another time. Right? Once you've tanked it once, it gets, it, the pull to go back to it, Satan doesn't have to try as hard anymore. So you have to try all the harder 
to stay connected to it. But guys, I think in our movement, it's so paramount that we've, we've gotten off the mission field. We can't look any other direction and go, well, yeah, you know. I got to take responsibility, you know. I got to do something. We've lost that. We've got to get it back, amen. We've got to get back what God has given us. We've got to get back our faith in action, right? We've got to share our faith. Like Vince said a couple of weeks ago, and he's probably said it many, many times to you, is only one thing we can take to heaven with us, right? And it's other people, our friends. That's right. So let's accumulate as many friends as we can, right? We've got to get there, stay on it, see what God's going to do in the end. Amen? Third and final, fix our thoughts. Hebrews chapter 3. Keep your finger there in 2 Corinthians, though. Don't turn it completely. We're going to come right back there, close by, in just a second. But I want to read two passages here. One in Hebrews, and one back in 2 Corinthians. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. We've got to affix ourselves on the Word. Amen? Fix our faith. And we've got to fix our thoughts, thirdly. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 says this. It says, Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. And then flip back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It talks about our heavenly dwelling. 5 and verse 1. It says, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Amen. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due Him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Fix our thoughts on heaven. I don't know if you've ever done a topical study about heaven just from the Scriptures you find. If you've never done that, I strongly encourage you to do that. It will reveal things that you never really thought about before and will really help you get a perspective. But you can tell by what Paul's writing here that he wants them to have a healthy perspective of heaven. He wants them to have the right perspective of heaven. It's important that we also heed these words and have a right perspective of heaven. You know, sometimes life throws us some real curveballs. Amen? Some real curveballs, you know, that really set us back emotionally. We go, I don't know if I can handle this. And I think in those moments, it's real easy for us, for our hope to be in heaven, you know. And I think even nowadays in our time, we look at it and we go, oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. Look at the problems of this world. Jesus, please come back. Stop this madness, you know. But part of us does that, I think, because we don't want to work to change it with God, ourselves. I know I do. You know, I'm like, man, I just want the easy button. (laughs) You know what I mean? Staples, yeah, we got that, you know. It's too easy to do it that way. God wants us to have a healthy perspective of heaven. People go through a lot of things in life. Everybody gets thrown curveballs that hurt, and they're devastating to their lives. And if we as disciples are not the ones that are going to be there to help them pick them up, nobody else is going to. Nobody else is going to have them, help them with the right perspective 
in life about what is really needed. You know, I think the first century Christians were, you know, of this mindset, they were not sure what the next day was going to bring. You know what I mean? So they had a lot of hope in heaven. You know, but it's way different than our hope. We don't face the persecution day in and day out that they faced. I mean, ongoingly. They didn't know if their kids would go home from school. They were going to be wiped out. They didn't know nothing about what the next day was going to bring. If you've never read about you know, the book of martyrs or never read about what happened to the first century church and the people and how they were treated, you know, it's phenomenal that their numbers continued to grow with so much happening to their people day in and day out. They were constantly being killed for their faith. We have no perspective. No perspective. We miss it. We're so comfortable in America. Right? And I think that comfort is the way... Satan is silently killing us. There's so many idols, so many things we can attach ourselves to, and silently because we're not fixing our eyes on heaven and the folks we can bring with us, we're slowly getting rocked to sleep and missing what God's trying to teach us about heaven. You know, the thought of heaven is pretty encouraging, though. You know what I'm saying? To know that God prepares a room for you. Yeah. Part of what the Bible tells us. Parts of the other part of the Bible tells us that I have a mansion prepared for you. You know what I mean? None of us probably in here are going to ever live in a mansion. All right? And if you are, we may be meeting in your home before it's all said and done. Amen? In your mansion. Right? We have a church in your basement. One week and then we'll move it up here. To whatever. But you get to picture what your mansion could be like. You know, I imagine walking out the front door in the morning, you know, and and jumping on a surfboard. I've never surfed before, but I always wanted to. You know what I mean? Imagine just being able to surf. Walking out the front door, I'm surfing in the morning. You know, in the afternoon, walking out the back door, I'm down the slopes, baby. You know, no matter what you think you can fathom, God created this world and everything in it as a testament to what he can do for you in your life. He wants to impress you. If you've never been impressed by God, just take a walk through the forest sometime. Make it a point to go see some mountains. Go see the great sequoias. Go do something where you go, whoo! God is awesome. You know? I hope has got to be in heaven. Not in what's seen on this earth. We will fear death. God wants us never to fear anything. But these people were looking forward to it. Paul talked about it often, and he always talked about it in that vein. I can't wait to go. I can't wait to go. I can't wait to be away from this earthly tent. I can't wait to go. I'll be rid of all these things. I cannot wait to go. You know? But if the only thing you're going to mourn when you're near death is the things that you're not going to have in this world, you're missing it. You're missing the heavenly perspective. we got to change our perspective. Amen? And like I said, today, this morning, is kind of a self-help lesson. You know? It's kind of a, here it is, do with it what you will. But there's a sense of accomplishment, like I said, with fixing stuff. Making it right with God. Making it right in this world. You will never experience more joy than seeing one of your friends, somebody you reached out to, studied the Bible with, get into the waters of baptism. And even your own kids someday. Never experience more joy than that. You won't. So let us affix ourselves to the world. Amen? Let us fix our faith for the sake of other people's faith. Amen? Let us fix our thoughts on heavens. To God be the glory. Amen.